hemoglobin consists of four individual polypeptide chains. We have the alpha-1 and alpha-2 chains which are identical with respect to one another. And we also have the beta-1 and the beta-2 chains which are also identical with respect to one another. And in each one of these polypeptide chains we have this red structure and these red structures are the heme groups. They contain the iron and the protoporphyrin that are responsible for binding diatomic oxygen. And because one heme group binds one O2 molecule, one hemoglobin molecule can bind a total, a maximum of four diatomic oxygen molecules. Now, usually, instead of picturing our hemoglobin as consisting of four individual chains, we look at the hemoglobin as consisting of two individual dimers. One of these dimers is the alpha-1, beta-1 dimer, and the other dimer is the alpha-2, beta-2 dimer. Remember, a dimer is simply a molecule that consists of two polypeptide chains. Now, because alpha-1 and because alpha-1 and alpha-2 are identical and beta-1 and beta-2 are identical, we see that alpha-1, beta-1 dimer is identical to alpha-2, beta-2 dimer. And we'll see in just a moment why we break it down into these two dimers instead of breaking it down into four individual polypeptide chains. Now let's begin by recalling some information about hemoglobin that we learned previously. So we said the fact that the oxygen binding curve for hemoglobin is sigmoidal basically implies that hemoglobin behaves in a cooperative fashion. And what that means is the different heme groups actually interact with one another. So as one of the heme group becomes occupied with oxygen, it causes the other heme groups to increase their affinity for oxygen. And likewise, when one of the heme groups releases the oxygen, the other occupied heme groups become much more likely to unload and release that oxygen. So this is what we mean by the cooperative nature and the cooperative behavior of hemoglobin molecules. Now, once again, what this implies is that the heme groups, the four heme groups in hemoglobin, somehow interact with one another. They cooperate with one another. But if we examine the structure of hemoglobin, we'll see that the four different hemoglobin molecules, the four different heme groups, these red structures within each polypeptide chain are actually separated by a certain distance. And what that implies is the heme groups do not actually interact with one another in a direct fashion. And as we'll see in just a moment, even though the heme groups do not interact with one another directly, the surfaces between the polypeptide chains do interact with one another. And more specifically, it's the surface to surface interaction between the two dimers in this hemoglobin that actually causes that cooperative behavior of hemoglobin. So to see how that takes place, let's take a look at the following diagram. So in this diagram to the left, we have the alpha helix of one of the polypeptide chains. And this alpha helix is attached to this heme group. So remember the heme group shown here consists of the organic component that is known as the protoporphyrin and it also contains that inorganic metal atom, that iron atom. Now the iron atom is attached to the proximal histidine amino acid that is attached to this polypeptide chain. And notice that because the oxygen is not attached to our iron atom, that iron atom is found below the plane of that protoporphyrin because when it's not bound to the oxygen, the iron is simply too large of an atom. It contains a large electron density. Now, this green structure is simply the surface of the adjacent polypeptide subunit. And notice there's a certain uh, distance between these two subunits and they interact in a certain way. Now, what happens when oxygen actually binds onto the iron of this heme group? So because of the electronegative character of oxygen, when diatomic oxygen shown here actually binds onto this heme group, more specifically onto the iron of that heme group, it pulls away some of that electron density from that heme group. It pulls away some of that electron density 
from that iron atom. And because some of the electrons move away from that iron atom, it decreases the electron density and the size of that iron atom. And now because the iron atom is smaller, it is able to move into the plane, into the center of the plane of that protoporphyrin as shown in the following diagram. So as the diatomic oxygen binds onto the iron, it pulls the iron inward into the center of the protoporphyrin molecule. And because the iron, which is this purple molecule here, is attached to that proximal histidine, it also pulls on that proximal histidine. And this in turn pulls on this entire alpha helix of that polypeptide chain. And so when the binding takes place, there is a change in surface to surface interaction between these two adjacent polypeptide chains. Notice the distance here and the distance here basically changes and this changes the electrostatic interaction between these two polypeptide chains. And it's this surface to surface interaction change that causes the cooperative behavior between the different polypeptide chains and the different heme groups found inside that polypeptide chain. So once again, as oxygen binds onto the heme group as shown in the following diagram, it decreases the size of that iron atom pulling it into the plane of the protoporphyrin. And since the iron atom is attached onto the proximal histidine, it pulls on that proximal histidine and that in turn pulls and shifts that entire polypeptide chain as shown in this diagram. So this shift causes a conformational change in the surface to surface interaction between the adjacent subunits. And this is precisely what leads to the cooperative behavior of the hemoglobin molecule. Now, if we examine the structure, the quaternary structure of the deoxyhemoglobin. Deoxyhemoglobin is simply the hemoglobin molecule in which the four heme groups are unoccupied. The quaternary structure of deoxyhemoglobin is very constrained because the interactions are not very good. And so because of this constrained nature of deoxyhemoglobin, we call that state the tense state or simply the T state. So the quaternary structure of deoxyhemoglobin is quite constrained. And for this reason, deoxyhemoglobin is said to exist in the T state where T stands for tense. Now, when oxygen begins to bind onto the heme group, it creates this conformational change and it causes this change in the interaction between the surfaces of the different polypeptide chains. And what this does is it lifts that constraint. It relaxes that tertiary, it, it, it relaxes that quaternary structure of that hemoglobin molecule. And that's precisely why when all the four heme groups become oxygen, occupied with oxygen because of the relaxed state of that quaternary structure of the hemoglobin we call this state the R state where R stands for relaxed. So we see that on the other hand even though deoxyhemoglobin is quite constrained and exists in the T state oxyhemoglobin contains a much more relaxed conformation due to the interactions between the surfaces of the polypeptide chains and this is called the R state or the relaxed state. Now, earlier I said that instead of looking at this hemoglobin molecule as consisting of four polypeptide chains, typically we examine the hemoglobin molecule as if it consists of two dimers, the alpha 1, beta 1, and the alpha 2, beta 2. Why is that? Well, that's because when our molecule goes from the tense state, the deoxyhemoglobin state, to the relaxed state, that oxyhemoglobin state, the two alpha beta dimers rotate 15 degrees with respect to one another. And this rotation is what causes this cooperative behavior of that hemoglobin molecule. This rotation is what causes that 
um, that shift to take place from the tense state to that relaxed state. So when hemoglobin is oxygenated, one of the alpha beta dimers rotates 15 degrees with respect to the second alpha beta dimer. And this shift leads to the cooperative behavior of hemoglobin. So we conclude that when we have the deoxyhemoglobin and one of the unoccupied heme groups begins to bind an oxygen molecule, it induces a conformational change from the T state to that relaxed state. And by inducing this change, there's a change in the surface to surface interaction between the polypeptide chains. And this is precisely what causes that cooperative behavior of the different heme groups found in each one of these polypeptide chains. And that's exactly why when one oxygen binds onto one of the heme groups, that conformational change causes the other heme groups to increase their affinity for binding oxygen.